So um, I'm Katie Bruce, and I'm going to be talking to you about a current project that we have going around family resilience. So this one, as opposed to Jeremy's, is much more conceptual in nature, um, and so it'll give you a good idea of the kind of variety of things that we, um, that we work on. So it started with a ministerial request, and it came in the form of this question. The question was, why do some families achieve despite the odds? Okay, fair enough question, you might think. So where does it sit if we go back to this evidence to action cycle? We can see that it sits in the translation space. It's okay, so what do we know about family resilience, i.e. achieving despite the odds, and how can we use that, translate it into a form that's ready to be used in policy and practice? So in that sense, you can see, okay, so we've got some specific family resilience research and theory sitting up there. So what do we need to do? We can do a tra straightforward translation into plain language, plain language version of the evidence. Okay, but actually what I found to be more useful going through this process and something that we talk about a lot at Supru is thinking about evidence as more of a dialogue rather than a one-way process. And I'm gonna talk you through the importance of the policy and the practice context in order to do that. Okay, so thinking about what it is that actually needs translating is the first key question and actually not that straightforward. So we know a fair amount about individual resilience, and increasingly we're starting to talk about, in the literature, about family resilience, and this is a real emerging area, and it builds on what we know um, from, from individuals. Okay. So families, that's obviously including not only the individuals within the family unit, but the relationships between them. So we define family resilience as a family's ability to adapt to risk and adversity by drawing on protective factors of individual members of the wider community and also the way in which the family functions. <coughs> but as it's an emerging area, it's also a complex area. So the technical concept of resilience is quite intangible. It uses other concepts such as risk factors and protective factors to help explain it, but even they themselves are not straightforward and we often use them in a very abstract sense. And when you add family to the mix, you add another layer of complexity. So what do we mean? What does it mean for a family to be resilient beyond the individuals within that family? And what does a family perspective actually add to the resilience debate? How can we translate that for policy and practice? What does that mean for them? So deciding what and how to translate isn't an easy task. And what we also found to be important is actually thinking about the practice context that we're working in in this space. So if we can agree on what family resilience is, then do we know what's effective at building it? What's the relevance of family resilience for our existing programs? And do we know if our existing interventions contribute to family resilience? So this involves engaging in thinking about what the relevant programs might be, which is another fairly complex issue when you're talking about an intangible concept. And thinking about you know, engaging with the right people and looking at the evaluations of programs that we have here in New Zealand and abroad. So resilience might be the goal, but it's difficult to measure. The ability to adapt to future adversity is key to a key concept in resilience. So really you're looking here for longitudinal data. We know that there are specific family resilience programs that have been developed in America and evaluated. So they're shown here in the orange triangle, so we want to be able to capitalize on that learning. But how are they relevant to our New Zealand context and what can we draw from them? So also the practice landscape is obviously the current context in which this translation is going to occur for practice. So we can, we can think about how, for example, Richie was talking about how we often focus at the crisis end, at, you know, in family crises. And we, but we know from the research that it's this cumulative adversity that makes it more difficult to be resilient. So actually the evidence is pointing more towards early intervention. An early intervention can then help protect against future risks and help us deal with them when they come along. 
In terms of moving to translating for policy, again, the context is really important. So family resilience being this abstract term doesn't have a natural resting place within a particular policy unit um, across government. So we need to think about who are we actually translating this evidence for. We want it to be more than just an interesting piece of um, piece of reason, you know, piece of synthesis, and actually be a relevant piece of work. And we do think it's relevant. We think it's relevant across different agencies, across different better public service targets, across different public priority issues. But how can we operationalize the concept? And that's a real challenge. So I think the challenge here for us in this paper is to raise the debate that's informed by theory and research, but speaks directly to government priorities. So, but I think there are other ways that we can think about the way that policy works to inform how we might do this. So policy language and mechanisms can inform us. For example, predictive risk modeling is something that's increasingly used um, by policymakers or by analysts within policy units to identify both priority groups and also to inform policy decision making. Ministers are presented with this data, but I think if we think about resilience, a resilience perspective can add information about why these risks can lead to poor outcomes for many, but not for others, and we start to ask those why questions. So I think underlying, understanding these underlying processes of resilience can inform our responses to these identifications of risk. So if I bring this all together, to make a practical and relevant translation actually becomes quite difficult, even when you first think, actually, no, this should be a fairly straightforward piece of work. Um, you know, it's a dialogue, and it's not a one-way process. So in terms of our learnings from this, and also our broader aims of what Superu is trying to achieve with this kind of a project, is really thinking about those needs of the user it's understanding the context, it's engaging early. So as Jeremy said, we're trying to establish the right question from the start and then responding to these needs. So trying to answer the question, but also being really clear about where we don't have evidence available to answer that particular question. So, you know, for us here, creating a common language for the dialogue is a more specific one that's relevant here. So resilience is a term that's used already in policy and practice, but it used to use quite differently often to how it's used in research and theory. So if we can get people on the same page, maybe that's a really good starting point. So we can spend quite a bit of time in the paper talking about what family resilience is. And I think that that is, from understanding the context, we then really saw that that was a really key need um, for us to do there. But also, ultimately, our aim is to influence the dialogue. You know, we're in this to create something with the evidence rather than just for it to sit on the side. So I think resilience here can give us an alternative lens through which to consider families at risk of poor outcomes. And it reinforces a strengths-based dialogue in an often risk-focused debate. So I think hopefully we can encourage policy and practitioners to think more broadly when they consider issues of risk and poor outcomes.